Hello and welcome to this episode of Undercurrent. I'm your host, Bas Tadros. We hope you've enjoyed the best scenes of 2018 over the break. We're back to full swing. And first up, I have a story for you where I'm speaking to John McBain about how to turn waste into useful resources. The form that he set up there is SUN, which is Sustainable Urban Nutrition. Kaya. Kaya is hello in Nunga. And you'll see we've got a sign over here that explains that. And we've also got another one somewhere that says Wanju Wanju, which is a beautiful phrase in Noongar, which means welcome together. So that can be you and me and the young fella, or it can be the viewers as well. So to all the viewers, we say Wanju Wanju, welcome together. And I hope you entertained and learned something from what we're doing here. I'm here today with John McBain and we're in South Perth and John started the Sustainable Urban Nutrition here in South Perth. John, how are you? Oh, I'm really good. So Sustainable Urban Nutrition, sun. And that's how I got the words. I started with sustainable because that's important for the present and the future, very important. And, um, and I was trying to think of a nice acronym and I thought, Sun. <laughs> so, Need that to grow things. You know, we got sunflowers you can see everywhere and the um but it's a it's a food project. So we take green waste, run it through our worm farm garden systems, so they convert waste into worm castings at the same time as they're growing food. And um and then we give a third of the food to charity. We give, a, we keep a third of the food, and the idea is we'll sell a third of the food. We're at 188 Canning Highway in South Perth, and you know I spent most of my life on farms, so <laughs> living on a highway in the city is pretty funny, really. But the um, the beautiful thing about the city is that it's so wasteful, right? And you know. The ABC are running a program about war on waste. Well, we actually love waste because we don't buy things, we collect them from what other people throw out. And we're showing people that waste is a resource. As soon as you see something as a resource, it ceases being waste in your head. But more importantly, when you start using it, it actually becomes a resource. How did you turn it into this uh, farming oasis? Well, it's um, it's just a step-by-step -step process. You know, we're looking to create change in society and sustainable change is evolutionary in nature. It's not revolutionary, it's step-by-step -step stuff. And that's how this global society's got to where it is today, whether you think it's good or bad. It's all happened step by step. And if we want to create a better society, we've got to do it step by step. John, what, what, are you, what is your hopes in terms of achieving uh, a greater way of, of giving and uh, who are you hoping to serve with this uh, plantation and uh, fruits and vegetables and things that you're growing? Oh, our aim is to change the whole world. <laughs> South Perth at a time. The, um, yeah, well, you know, one plate at a time, one plant at a time. You know, I'm the president of the Australian City Farms and Community Gardens Network. And part of our thing is we grow food, but we grow community. And so we've got, you know, hundreds of gardens spread across Australia. John, thank you for, for leading by example. Oh, look, that's our pleasure. And, you know, I'm 66 now. And, being old or reasonably old is a privilege, but it also has a responsibility that comes with it. So I've been fortunate to spend most of my life in sustainable stuff and sustainable agriculture. And I can see a need for this sort of stuff in society. So it's my joy, but also my responsibility, my duty to create stuff with that knowledge and pass it on. Excellent, thank you. If you're a local, get down here, 188 Canning Highway in South Perth and meet John in person and pick something up from his garden.
I'm Bas Tadros for Undercurrent. The WA government is about to exercise its full clout over the family-run cray fisheries industry by flooding it with 17,000 cray pots of their own. Naturally, this causes great concern for long-standing cray fishermen over this delicate ecosystem and what they say to be heavy-handedness and lack of transparency by the fisheries minister, Mr Dave Kelly. Angela with the story, speaking to long-standing cray fishermen. The cray fishing industry is incredibly significant. Uh, we have a turnover of $500 million for the economy each year. Crayfish has always been known as a luxury item. The economies before China through the 70s and 80s was the Japanese economy. After that economy collapsed in Japan and the Chinese economy picked up, we were starting to have a windfall through that export and that's why we were basically making up the difference between catching less and earning more. Our industry under a quota system is incredibly heavily regulated. It's a good thing in one sense because it's well placed. There's no room for corruption in our industry and if you do sell crays outside your quota, you'll be fined heavily. To give you an example of standard day's catch, we're to inform the government before we leave that we are going fishing for the day. Prior entering port with our catch, we have to inform the government roughly how many crates of crayfish we have on board. And then once we are in port and we're weighing in our crayfish, immediately after the weigh-in, we have to report to the government the exact amount of kilos that we, that we have caught. And that is in correlation to what we are allowed to catch for our individual quotas per boat. To possibly turn over a billion dollars for the government, more or less identified by industry as a quick money grab through releasing the 17,000 pots and putting pressure on the biology of taking 1,350 tonnes from the ocean. Licences are sold within industry. There's no licences released by the government. If you want to acquire a licence, you have to buy one which is already existing. And from that point on, what you will pay is a registration fee or what we call an excess fee to the government each year so they can manage the fishery. The management of the fishery, what I do know, costs the government roughly around $10 million a year to manage. And through the payment of access fees or registration, the government gets a windfall of $20 million. So they virtually make 100% plus on their money each year. Releasing the 17,000 pots has been more or less identified by industry as a, a quick money grab to possibly turn over a billion dollars for the government, releasing the 17,000 pots and putting pressure on the biology of taking 1,350 tonnes from the ocean. Owning 17,000 pots and wanting to release them into the industry, it outstrips anybody in the industry in the sense of their ownership. Each family, on average, generally would own between something like one to 200 pots. What the government wants to do they could do it in a better way in the sense of the local tag uh, lobster program. Simple procedure, government gives us more tags instead of 100 tags per boat, two to 300 tags per boat. What the general public could consume and be done in a far simpler way for A, to make it easy for the public and B, to make it easy for the fishermen and to bring back possibly more tradition to the industry. As a collective, the amount of pots in the industry is roughly around 63,000. 220 boats, direct employment on the vessels in the vicinity of six or seven hundred people but the, the offshoot of that through being on the slips, getting work done to your vessels, I've been told the figure is about six thousand people were involved in the work of the industry uh, planned by Minister Dave Kelly to introduce 17,000 pots and have the government own it, tends to lean towards unionism nationalism, all the industries in Australia do not work under currently the fishing industries right around the country are watching the cray industry to see how this is going to play out at the end of the day because they are quite concerned that the government could step into their industries and do exactly the same to what they've done to the cray fishing industry. Take part ownership, instead of playing the umpire role, play owner of industries. It's not something which has been done in this country. As far as I can gather from the feedback from all the fisheries in the, in the country, they are all up in arms about what is actually happening to the cray industry. Generally, I would say on average that each family would own between one to 200 pots. 
as a collective, the amount of pots in the industry is roughly around 63,000. The direct employment on the vessels, six or seven hundred people. The offshoot of that through being on the slips, getting work done to your vessels, six thousand people were involved in the work of the industry. I would be considered a shallow water fisherman. There's some guys who will work the offshore, the deeper waters, and there's some guys who will work the shallow waters like myself, inshore fishery. So the guys who work the outshore fishery are normally a bigger licence and they will go further afield into greater depths. Currently there is around about 220 boats fishing. I'm one of the smallest licences on the coast so I just run around in a 45 foot boat. The boats can be as, as big as 80 foot from what I gather. Or we work under what's called a quota system and so for every pot you've got you've got X amount of kilos allocated for each pot that you can catch. So for argument's sake, our license is actually based on 95 pots, so we've got approximately 8.3 tonne to go and catch per year, which is probably one of the smallest quotas on the coast. So there's other boats in the industry which could have 200 pots, and they can have up to 16, 17 tonne, and I've heard tonnages go up to 100 to 200 tonnes for some boats when they've just amalgamated many licences and put them onto one boat. Most of the fishers are all independent fishers. Uh, basically, uh, we're all families. There is uh, a few families which have got more than one boat, but they've taken it to a high risk level where they've bought process factories and, and they own their own boats. And they've actually marketed it through tourism. A classic example of that is the Thompson family. They do a fantastic job up the coast. They've got a little lobster shack. I believe 100,000 people go through there a year who get to sample the crayfish through tourism and locals. But their outlay has been at great risk to their family. Other families in the industry are like myself, just uh, small license holders. And we just go from one generation to the next, holding the one license, supporting our family. Intended to go fishing because I've been going out on fishing boats ever since I was about four years of age grandfather started in 1908 and then went through the generations to my father and then to myself. For me I, that's what I knew what I wanted to do uh, from a very young age. One I think you have to have a passion for it for going to sea each day and enjoying that sort of lifestyle. You breathe fresh air and you work hard and you make a good living. The government wants to release 17,000 pots on the claim. They want to get cheaper crays to the general public and help the tourism of West Australia. Nothing short of a money grab because 17,000 pots sold back into the industry would be a windfall for the government of roughly around about a billion dollars. And that's where industry is up in arms. We are in recovery mode, as I've stated, from 2010. Scientists have already said that it is not a good idea to bring it to the brink of the biology and to undo 10 years of hard work by fishermen working with the research. Bringing the, the industry backwards, it's literally bringing us back to the Stone Age again from 2010 where crays were hard to catch, expenses were high and we were paid little. They could do it in a better way in the sense of the local tag uh, lobster program by giving the crayfishmen more tags, simple procedure, government gives us more tags instead of 100 tags per boat, two to 300 tags per boat. What the general public could consume and be done in a far simpler way. Stay with us, we'll be back after this ad break with more undercurrent stories.